Thank you for joining us here at First Baptist Church of San Antonio, whether online or on broadcast, in your homes or wherever you may be. We want you to know that you are more than welcome to be a part of the life of this church, and we want you to know that we want you to meet Jesus today. In order for this to happen regularly, we need your support, we need your prayers, and we need your financial gifts. Please continue to give and be a part of what we do today. Don't get too comfortable. In fact, yeah, you can go ahead and stand back up. We're going to read aloud the text. Let me, let me draw your attention to Job chapter 14, and we're going to remain standing as we read uh, Job 14, 7 through 17. This week, our reverse text has taken us from Job 13 into Job 14, and we're going to use Job 14 to help us walk to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let us read aloud together then Job 14, 7 through 17 in your bulletin. This then is the text for today. For there is hope for a tree when it is cut down that it will sprout again and its shoots will not fail. Though its roots grow old in the ground and its stump dies in the dry soil, at the scent of water it will flourish and put forth sprigs like a plant. But man dies and lies prostrate. Man expires and where is he? As water evaporates from the sea and a river becomes parched and dried up, so man lies down and does not rise until the heavens are no longer. He will not awake nor be aroused out of his sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath returns to you, that you would set a limit for me and remember me. If a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my struggle, I will wait until my change comes. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the work of your hands, for now you number my steps. You do not observe my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag and you wrap up my iniquity. May God bless the reading of his word. It is a distinct smell. A smell that around here is the smell of refreshment. One whiff and you're invigorated. One scent and the brown in the grass begins to turn to a green. There's a name for this smell. It's called petrichor. It is the smell of rain. And in a dry and thirsty land like South Texas, there's little more provocative than the smell of rain blowing in before a storm. It's a sign of life. This is a hopeful moment that the hardened soil and the thirsty cattle will soon be quenched. Now, at this point in Job's story, he finds this truth both confusing and annoying. Now, remember to date Job's story. Job has lost nearly everything. Job has lost his wealth. Job has lost his livestock. Job has lost many of his servants, and his children are dead, tragically killed in a storm. And now, Job is likely months into a terrible illness that has separated him so far from life that the grave is now preferable to his pallet upon the ash heap. I want us to read again. Look with me at Job 14, 7 through 9. So Job notices there's hope for a tree when it's cut down that it will sprout again. Its shoots will not fail. Though its roots grow old in the ground and its stump dies in the dry soil, at the scent of water it will flourish and put forth sprigs like a plant. 
from where Job now sits, it perplexes him that life springs forth from the earth at just the scent of water, while his body is deteriorating unto death. You see, Job calls our attention to the tree, and not just any tree, but a tree that has been ripped apart. Picture lightning striking so forcefully into a tree that it's split in two. Or maybe we imagine something like this. Picture an annoyed workman whose sole purpose this day is to fell an old oak in the way of progress. And Job recalls we've all seen this happen. Nature obliterates a tree where the lumberjack chops it down to its roots. And it just so happens that at the scent of the rain, out comes a little branch, then a single leaf. And that tree grows and assumes that soil again. With the slightest bit of moisture in the air, life springs forth for the tree. And in all of Job's suffering, we've had 13 chapters we've been studying of Job's suffering, and all the while he is staring in the face of death. He remembers these spirited moments of creation, and he cries out to God, why? Why is this so? And it's not that he is angry at the fresh sprout, but his mind is terrorized by the fact that God would ordain such a beautiful rebirth to happen on the forgotten forest floor, yet man is confined to a casket. This is what Job means in verse 10. You'll read it again with me. But man dies and lies prostrate. Man expires and where is he? Then the first line of verse 14, if man dies... Will he live again? You see, Job is now wrestling with this reality in his own mind that he has seen his family, his ten children, whom he loved dearly, lowered into their graves. And death lingers still. Death hangs over him like a darkened shadow. In fact, he knows that the disturbed soil that covers the bodies of his children will likely settle the next time it rains. But there is no life coming out of those graves. Will they live again? That's why he's asking this question in verse 14. Are they going to live again, God? And now in in the, the terror of his struggle, he's saying, God, am I going to live? Is life ever going to be renewed for me? Will I live again? You know, Job comes to this question with honest concern. After examining creation, Job is unnerved that that he doesn't know the answer to this question. Because based on his current experience, it seems as though the tree holds a favor with God that Job does not. As moisture blows in on the breeze, a fig tree can find new life, but Job cannot. You know, it would be awful if the book of Job ended here. It would be awful if Scripture ended right here in this moment where Job is asking God, is this the end? Is my story over? Is life as we know it done? Is this story over? God, is your story over? And if Scripture ended here, If the book of Job ended here, we would have this question lingering, just as it's lingering over Job like a dark shadow. But praise the Lord, this is not the end. It's not the end of the story, it's not the end of Job, and it's not the end of the Scriptures. Because what we know as the rest of Job unfolds, and as the rest of the pages of Scripture turn, It answers this very question when Job says, will man live again? The whole of the rest of the scriptures scream, yes, Job. Yes, man will live again. 
by the blood of Jesus Christ, man will live again. You see, wallowing on the ash heap, it's hard to imagine where God is going to lead in the days ahead. But after Job, we hear more. After Job, we hear from the prophets pointing ahead, the prophets pointing us to Jesus, we, and we hear from Jesus pointing us ahead to new life. In fact, as you turn through these pages and you move from Job into the prophets, you move from Job to somewhere like Ezekiel. Ezekiel is confronted with this same question in Ezekiel chapter 37. There, the prophet has shown a gruesome scene beyond life, a pile of rotting bones baking under the sun. There's no moisture lingering in this desert. And the Lord comes to Ezekiel to ask Job's question. Can this pathetic pile of bones live again? You know, we've heard in Scripture of young men being, being raised to life after death. But that was just hours after their death. Those bodies were hardly cold. See, when they were raised, it was Elijah raising one up, Elisha raising another up. But it was so near to life. And now God brings Ezekiel to an absurd proposition. Can an eroded femur be reborn into new life. And Ezekiel, like Job, is unconvinced. But what we see as the story unfolds is God proved to be the God of life. That God created this world. He created all that's in it. And, and all that is around us, God created out of nothing. It was into a dark and formless void that God spoke life into existence. Then on the forest floor, God caused the leafy twig to sprout from the stump. Then God took and obliterated Israel and gave them new life to carry on towards the promised Messiah. You see, this is that story that we read in Ezekiel. If you'll look there with me, it's Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm going to read verses 12 through 14. This is God speaking to Ezekiel. It says, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people, I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. Here in Ezekiel, the, the Spirit of God moves in like the scent of rain. And the Spirit of God brings with it impossible life, life from death, color into darkness, so that life surprisingly springs forth from bones picked apart by buzzards. You see, it, it's perplexed us all. And so it was with Job. So it was with Ezekiel, who didn't know what to say to God. And neither did the women who walked into Jesus' tomb. When they were confronted with the same question, can a dead man live again? They didn't know what to say. In fact, they, they assumed that somebody had stolen the body. They had come to prepare Jesus' body for the grave. And when they were confronted with the question, can a dead man live again? They didn't know where to turn. Then, as they were told, they took that message to the disciples. The disciples said it was nonsense. When the disciples were met with that question, can a dead man live again? The disciples said, nonsense. Look with me at Luke chapter 24, verse 11. This is where they respond to that message. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. Jesus' own disciples. It wasn't as though they hadn't seen Jesus raise others, others from the dead. They, they had seen Jesus' power raise others from the dead. Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, a widow's son. But those were distant memories, as were Jesus' promises. So that question, can a dead man live, was nonsense even for the disciples. 
See, the disciples then were like Job, stuck on Golgotha. They, they could only picture a skull atop a hill of death. They couldn't yet imagine all that God had in store for them. See, though this life is plagued by death, and though we find inhospitable conditions all around us, all it takes is the slightest breath of God for life to spring forth. See, as the smell of rain announces a coming downpour, all life-giving activity on this earth is preceded by the breath of God. And when God was sifting through the dirt in Genesis chapter 2, Adam wasn't yet animated. It wasn't until God breathed into him this breath of life that life came forth. You see, it was when this, the Spirit of God rushed in that the valley of dry bones rose up into a mighty army in that desert. And Job is going to know this soon. We aren't quite there yet, but Job will soon find out that God would turn that ash heap of despair into new life for Job. God would soon breathe on Job's dreadful and decaying body so that new life would be restored. Out of a pandemic, what might God do in you? Out of this painful season, what might God do in us? Because our God of life sets forth to bring exceedingly great joy into your despair. Let the breath of God surround you. Let the breath of God invigorate you. I know there has been much to mourn the last couple of years. But Easter is here, and the Spirit of God is stirring. That same power that raised Jesus from the grave is causing new life to spring up everywhere. And may that new life spring up in each one of our hearts and in this church as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And may the smell of the Spirit be as refreshing as the smell of the rain. May the smell of the Spirit be a sign of new life as God raises us up out of the dreadful decay of sin and death to new life in Jesus Christ. And that Spirit is stirring. That Spirit is moving in us today. May we surrender unto a God, sacrificing ourselves so that new life might spring forth. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we need you. We need the breath of our living God to come and fill us up that we might have life. And Lord, we, we pray that you would bring us out of those pits of despair that we might find the joy of the Lord. Rejoice with one another in your goodness. Lord, we know that you're stirring. We know that you're bringing new life. And Lord, we pray that each one of us would experience it. That each one of us would know that new life in Jesus Christ today. And it's in his name the name of our risen Lord that we pray. Amen.